It's the voice recognition is different from the side, so I guess it is the same thing. Okay. Okay, we are writing. This is the you can remind people now. You can remind me twice. I still often put the timer up just because it's easier for the, for the speaker. But I can switch over it. Just giving folk another minute or two to walk in. Yeah, the wall is done now. Yep. Minutes. It's currently 3:30 a.m. on the east coast, so it'd be midnight. Well, thirty. Yeah, yeah about midnight. So. Possible that she forgot or you know, set an alarm and said to it. Actually, like, see what the hell you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we should actually, we should actually test it if you're driving. Should we pull it and plug it in? And then we should also test to make sure the clicker works because. Uh, what? No. Can you? No, I think the battery's dead. Maybe. Uh, laser. Yeah, the laser is not doing anything. If you click on them, they won't likely won't show up because it will go outside meet echo. Yeah, I, I don't think you can click. We, we could we could do a share <coughs> we could share a screen but that goes weirdly. Because I'm not 
sharing my May I follow you sharing the material of you? Focus on the box of cutted. Hello everybody. So let's start the benchmarking methodology working group session for this ITF 118. So, uh, I am the new chair. Um, and Sara is hopefully connecting remotely. I don't know. But in any case, we also have Warren here. So, uh, yeah, just a few words. If you are not subscribed to the PMWG mailing list and would like to be, you can visit the website and easily subscribe to me. Uh, the usual note well for of the ITF. So it's uh, important information that you must read and understand. And uh, it's something that is the foundation for ITF participation. Yeah, also um, some um, presentation from my side. So my first ITF meeting was in 2014. Uh, the first uh, participation in BMWG was in 2015. Uh, I'm actually living in Italy, but I also live in Munich, in Germany. Uh, yeah, I have more than 10 years of experience in networking and technology, especially in IT performance measurement and uh, on stuff. I graduated in Naples, in Italy, and lived in Turin, Munich, and now I'm in Italy. Let's go to with the BMWG agenda. Um, um, if you have comment, if you want to add something, uh, please uh, raise your hand and let us know. Uh, in any case, I want to highlight two main points about the agenda. Regarding the stateful chat, the working group plus call is coming, so it's, it's likely to happen after this ITF. There was also a request to revise the EDPN draft. I don't know if Sadin is connected or not, but uh, there was a, la a lack of support, so we are not taking this work again. But in any case, if in the future there will be new support, on the mailing list, we can continue this work as well on EDPN. Uh, there was also some discussion on the segment routing draft that will remain uh, separate drafts, also after some discussion with the authors and also other uh, contributors. Okay, this is the agenda. So we will start usually with the working group draft and then the new proposal. And in the end, we will also present some new test results from March. few words about the status. Of course, more reviewers is always needed. So work is adopted, completed, and published as an RFC. So please read the document, share your feedback on the list as usual. So we have several interesting documents, uh, MPLS segment routing benchmarking, IPv6 segment routing benchmarking, the consideration for benchmarking on container infrastructure, and the idea is to keep this interesting proposal, but of course, we also need feedback and input from the community. New RFC was RFC 9411, in, published in March. Uh, we also updated the milestone about the stateful NAT for that, and um, the 
the, the chaff step is quite stable. And there is also a supplementary BMWG page if you are interested in more material. This is the Melstone revised, so we added the benchmarking for stateful native six run stateful. Yeah. Okay. I think we can start with the first presentation. I don't know if you want to add something. No, just as I always used to say, you know. BMWG is a very friendly group and we try to be nice to each other, so let's try and be nice to each other. Any other questions? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Stole the batteries from the projector. <laughs> ah, and one last thing, if you are participating, you, are, you can record your attendance here. Also, if you want to join the queue, you have to scan this and it's the Mythico online platform. And maybe you can this um, I think it's the Actually, we have a question in the queue first. So. Oh, no more. Um, it, was, it went away. Okay, okay. Maybe it was a mistake. Sweet. Oh, it's been swapping the whole, the whole thing. Okay. So those are good batteries. I stole, I stole the batteries from there from the projector. So. So how much time do we have? Uh, uh, how long is it? 20. It's a presenter. 10 for me, 10 for the most presenter. Great. Okay. okay. Timer, 20. Great. Yes? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Maciej Konstantinowicz. I'm going to be co-presenting with Radko. Uh, Radko will be presenting remotely from Miteko from uh, Bratislava in Slovakia, just around the corner from here. But he didn't, uh, he didn't make it. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, MLR search draft. It has been in works for the last five years. And um, the, the, the adventure with the work that, that was presented here actually started in 2016. And um, it has uh, relevance and relations to the RFC 1242, RFC 2544, uh, Al Morton's FCTST 009, and uh, it's really uh, targeted at, at uh, software networking um, applications. Um, it took us. Can you speak much closer to the mic? Apparently, the remote is coming from the way. Much closer to the mic? I'm usually quite loud. <laughs> so I'm surprised that the mic doesn't pick up. But let me just... these, these mics are fairly low sensitive. Right, is that better? Mm, yeah. yes. Now I can hear myself for the speakers. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk like this. Um, so, software networking. Um, we have a number of uh, different set of technologies. The revol revolution of SDN and NV started in 2012. Number of standards and standard related uh, efforts like uh, OpenNV. Um, and Linux Foundation networking. And the project that I represent, uh, which is Fast Data IO, where we developed MLR search in. And um, so, yeah, in terms of the draft update, um, we posted uh, 05 
on the 23rd of October. Um, for the first time, way ahead of uh, deadline, i.e. few hours. Um, we believe now the draft is actually readable. Definitely the problem statement and the approach taken. And the specification is readable, but requires work. And uh, we encourage everybody and uh, welcome all contributors, reviewers, and also looking for co-authors for us to help us harden the, the approach. Um, and I will, uh, uh, we're going to cover actually BMW, BMWG next steps uh, later on at the, at the end. So I'm going to run for the first two topics. I have about uh, seven minutes to cover them. I'm going to hand over to uh, Vratko, who will uh, cover the specification parts remotely, and then we're going to wrap up. So I wanted to bring up this notion of uh, time and, uh, and energy, and uh, time in a sense of efficiency and moving fast, and energy in a, in a, uh, in a context of doing this in a sustainable manner. And uh, when you apply those to software networking, you would know that um, software networking software is less efficient energy-wise than, than on dedicated ASICs and NPUs. And that's why one needs to really uh, be very disciplined when one codes the data plane specifically, and when, when you deploy it um, on either appliances or in a cloud infrastructure environments, public cloud, carrier cloud, private cloud. And the clicker stopped working. Yeah. It's okay. So next slide, please. No, no, no. Yeah, you can. Right. Now, now it should yeah. work. Yeah. Because my mistake. And there is a laser. Okay. So I'm going to cover five problems um, that we are uh, addressing. And um, we would like the working group to recognize those problems as valid problems and, um, and validate them uh, together with us. Um, and uh, we see all of them, all five, as absolutely critical to make software networking benchmarking successful. And if you follow the, the two known computer scientists, Hennessy and Patterson, who, you know, inventors of risk five and so on, who say that, you know, for better or worse, benchmarking shapes the field, we, we uh, strongly believe that MLR search approach is one of those things that will drive and shape the software networking, and we want to make sure that we do it the better way. So the first problem is the long search. Uh, a standard uh, binary search and uh, bisection is slow uh, because you know, most time is spent away from the interesting region, so discovering the throughput as we define it. And um, if, you, if you want to speed it up, you need to reduce the, the precision, but due to the logarithmic uh, nature of, of bisection, um, you don't really actually win that much time. Why do we need to reduce the duration? Well, we want to use less power, and we also want to run those searches as part of the CI/CD pipelines that run thousands and thousands of tests. The other problem is the DUT in SUT, and this is actually the one that took us the longest. In fact, we've been in operation for seven years. MLR Search got uh, start. We started to work on MLR Search about six years ago. Um, and I think that's where we started to produce the drafts about five years ago or so. Um, and it is this problem, the DUT and SUT. If you look at the definitions of uh, DUT and SUT in, uh, in RFC 2285 and 2544, uh, DUT is the single networking device that is exposed to the, to the stimulus. SUT, on the other hand, is a combination of those devices. Um, in our case, we have the SUT, the code server, hardware, with operating system, a number of applications running in parallel to our software DUT. Of course, we can do a standalone test, and that's what we started. That's how we started the journey. But um, at the end, um, it is actually the real deployments are like uh, that. So. The way we go about it, um, we basically recognize the fact that the UT is subject of, of interference from these other things, and it's also sharing the hardware resources. Um, it does exhibit fluctuating performance, and we actually uh, characterize the performance as a spectrum of performance. And this is the spectrum of performance that we discover. 
Um, there are some other notes here. They actually pretty much copy verbatim from the draft. I'm not going to read that, but uh, we have a notion of noiseful and of the performance spectrum and the noiseless. We are after discovering the noiseless because it is uh, representing closer or is a closer summation of the actual DUT performance. Third problem is um, the repeatability and comparability. And um, when, you have, when you operate in the noisy environment, 2544 and uh, bisecting tends to um, uh, wander away from the, the region that we are really interested in. And depending on, uh, where, you know, on the environment you're testing in, uh, the sources of noise may be slightly off. So you end up with different results. And when you look at software networking benchmarks over the last seven years, uh, you can actually see that, um, whether these are open source labs, um, whether these are people in OpenNV, um, uh, Linux uh, distributions, um, it's, it's, very, it's very visible. So the way for us to, to address that is, again, to provide, the, to report the spectrum. And, um, and if we solve the, the DUT and SUT problem, uh, we expect to also improve the repeatability and comparability of uh, the results. And comparability here is between you know, different runs, but also different testing environments. Then there's a problem four, which is a, a throughput with non-zero. And um, here, uh, uh, really, uh, where was I? Right. So, I grew up in networking from 1995, um, testing hardware networking systems. And in that times, testing the, the non-zero loss was, was very rarely used. People were looking for zero loss throughput. Um, in software networking world, um, people actually accept the non-zero loss more than non not uh, because the zero loss means a single packet gets lost over the, the 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or whatever the duration is. And it basically drives the drives the drives the uh, the, the result. So uh, the non-zero loss is sort of accepted in software networking, um, whether we we like it or not. And uh, our approach here is to actually um, propose a non-zero loss as a first-order citizen, but not to really neglect or ignore the the zero loss. So the throughput as defined by two five four four but really to recognize the fact that it doesn't always apply and uh, provide the tool set in the shape of MLR search to discover multiple rates at different, at, at different non-zero loss and zero loss in a single search work. The last one is inconsistency of trial results. Um, in 2544, you know, we don't repeat a step. Uh, in our approach, we do. And uh, dealing with those is, uh, is a hard problem. And we have a new quantity that actually addresses that. Radko will, will cover, cover this. Now, um, the approach we are proposing in the draft, and uh, we have it uh, implemented in open source, um, is to use some uh, tricks to get us to the uh, interesting region sooner. And that's the uh, introduction of preceding targets and also some pre initial trials that do not follow uh, bisection. In the DUT UCT, uh, we go with the, uh, the noiseless and noiseful performance spectrum. Radko will describe how it is discovered. And um, repeatability and comparability, they, they really come as a, as a uh, result of addressing the DUT and SCT problem. And we actually, um, uh, MLR search does achieve benefits that have been uh, noted or um, classified by Al uh, Morton as uh, a binary search with loss verification in both his last RFC, RFC 9004, and also the Etsy TST009 that came from uh, Al's work in OPNLV. Throughput with non-zero was already covered, and its consistent trial results. Um, we're taking a conservative approach. Again, Radko will, will cover uh, those. So with that, um, I wanted to hand over to Radko from uh, the bridge. 
Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so let's go. Uh, MR search specification, uh, that is uh, the main focus uh, of our draft. Uh, the idea is uh, that the whole search process can be abstracted as consisting of three components, manager, controller, and measurer. Uh, our uh, main uh, contribution is uh, the logic inside the controller, but uh, uh, we need to also describe some parts of the measurer and the manager so that uh, everything uh, works nicely together. Uh, the controller uh, does have uh, some inputs and produces some outputs, and uh, the specification is uh, in some places very precise, uh, and at defining how the output values uh, relates to the inputs and the trial results. Uh, I will talk about uh, that later. Uh, the distinction from uh, how the draft ori originally started is uh, that uh, this uh, piece of work was uh, implemented code first. So first uh, we had a working Python library that was doing uh, multiple decisions, trying to be smart, trying to save as much time as possible without sacrificing precision and repeatability. But uh, most of those tricks are actually not important uh, from the point of view of repeatability. And uh, frequently, as we published uh, and uh, employed different versions of the library, those optimizations were changing quite a bit between those versions. So in this draft, I'm focusing just on the specification, which is the bare minimum that users uh, or implementers would need to follow so that they reap the benefits while leaving them freedom to apply different optimizations. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the Requirements uh, in the specification are most uh, in the form of uh, API, application programming interface. So we are looking at the controller as a piece of software and we are defining uh, the input values, output values, how does it interact with the manager and uh, uh, how does it interact with uh, the measurer. Uh, the measurer is quite uh, simple. Uh, it is told duration and uh, load and it performs one trial as described in RFC 2544 and uh, returns the result. The main result attribute uh, is a trial loss ratio and controller basically works with that. Uh, the controller, when it is uh, called by the manager, it is called only once and it performs uh, the whole uh, search. So it discovers uh, all the outputs it needs for uh, every goal it has uh, been given. So one search goal, uh, as you see uh, from the name, multiple loss search, initially there was only a, one attribute related to the different goals, and uh, that was uh, the loss ratio. Now, as you can see, the, there are multiple uh, goal attributes. Uh, this is, as over time, we have uh, added more functionality and uh, give uh, users more freedom to decide what is what they are searching for. For example, users that uh, want to have the unconditional, uh, how is it called? Unconditional, not compatibility. Uh, that thing uh, for RFC 2544, there is a set of uh, values uh, that when the user uses, the return value is really the throughput as defined in RFC 2544. But of course, uh, users uh, can uh, change the values. So if they want non-zero loss ratio, there is attribute for that. Uh, if they want to have multiple trials uh, at the same load, uh, as uh, in uh, this uh, Etsy document, they can uh, achieve that while using uh, three attributes, final try duration, duration sum, and exit ratio. Uh, when the duration sum is, for example, five times the final trial duration, the uh, search is forced to do five trials uh, at that duration, at that load. And the exit ratio is uh, basically telling the search 
how many of those five trials can give higher loss, but be ignored. Uh, ignoring in this case is a good thing because uh, some of those trials may be affected by this noiseful uh, part of the performance spectrum and giving higher exit ratio allows the search to ignore more of that. So the value that is reported at the end is closer to the noiseless part of the spectrum, which we want to invest investigate because this is closer to the idealized DOT performance and it is also more stable, so better repeatability and comparability. There are also other optional attributes uh, needed for various uh, uh, time optimizations, for example, irrational trial duration, but those are not part of the specification as we envision that there may be other smarter options in the future and we do not want to, to limit that. Next slide, please. Uh, but there is uh, one part uh, that is required uh, by the specification. Uh, basically, it uh, uh, connects uh, the input values to the output values, and uh, this has to be strict, otherwise uh, we lose uh, comparability between uh, different uh, implementations. Uh, uh, maybe one thing to point out here is uh, the rel relevant lower bound. There is small type uh, that says uh, only amount loads smaller than the relevant upper bound. This is uh, how we deal with uh, loss emission problem. So if there is zero loss at higher load, but no zero loss uh, at lower load, we focus on that lower load and uh, ignore the upper load. That is uh, one of the decisions that went into the design. So it is now part of the classification. Conditional throughput, uh, I think I can talk about it on the next slide. So go ahead to the next slide. So conditional throughput uh, definition, uh, it, it is basically telling a forwarding rate of one of the trial, trial results that were executed at a relevant lower bound. And uh, this is the thing that I'm still not 100% uh, I got it right this time. So uh, I think it is uh, okay, but uh, maybe I will change my mind. Definitely the definition in draft 04 was not a good one. And yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is an example showing why the previous definition wasn't good, but I'm already out of the time. So next slide, please. Actually, Vratko, this is uh, the, the penultimate slide. So can you cover at least the example properly? Thank you. Uh, it depends how much time do I have. 45 seconds. <laughs> Plus 15 uh, if you really need. Okay. But it so, would be good uh, to, to walk through the examples because uh, we miss the graphs. So uh, there so. will be graphs uh, in the part where we present uh, the the real results. Uh, there is a good place for it. But yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So this is an example uh, where uh, the settings uh, re require seven trials to be executed uh, to decide. Uh, and in this case, six trials uh, are sufficient uh, for the decision because uh, no matter what the last remaining uh, uh, does, uh, it doesn't change uh, the result. But uh, because uh, NDR and PDR were investigating the same load, PDR that would be happy only after five trials now got six trial and uh, we need to pick one of the, the results uh, to report uh, as a conditional throughput. In uh, the uh, draft uh, 05, we pick uh, the bold one, so zero, and uh, this is fine. Both NDR and PDR report the uh, same throughput. In the uh, previous version, uh, we did the average, which got uh, us a counterintuitive result of PDR being lower than NDR, which is what we do not want. And in graph 04, the conditional throughput was required. So that is not good. So that's why in uh, draft 05, it is no longer required. It is still recommended as a way to give better 
feedback to users compared to uh, offered load because what is the uh, offered load uh, telling you if you expect the, some part of the, the traffic to be lost. And if there are questions uh, specific about this slide, I can talk about it. Uh, okay, thank you, Vatko. Yeah, so this is uh, the important uh, slide for this presentation. Uh, there are parts uh, that uh, are ready or ready enough. Uh, there are still some typos and uh, things like that. As usual, we ran out of time when editing it, but uh, uh, the problem statement and uh, the specification uh, should be fine. Uh, there are some details. For example, currently this draft contains uh, also explanation to go with the MLR search specification and those explanations may be two verbosis in place. This is uh, also some parts uh, of the uh, definitions are given as a pseudocode, which is not formatted properly. It will be formatted properly later. And yeah, uh, the pseudocode may be too hard to, to follow. We will think about uh, how to make it better. And also there are some places that are opportunities uh, to make the MLR search uh, specification or library even more user-friendly but uh, those are not like important points. This just like uh, improvements uh, to what the, what the draft already contains. And next slide, please. That's no, that's all. it. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Vratko. So uh, this is our last slide. Um, I wanted to add uh, two points if I uh, may, and apologies for running uh, over time. So the context, um, of, uh, of that is um, we're using MLR search in LFN fast data IO. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, CPU vendors, uh, ARM, uh, Intel, AMD, and, um, and Ampere computing now. Um, NVIDIA and uh, Marvel are about to join by shipping us uh, hardware to the open source labs. Um, so um, time allowing at the end of the BMWG meeting, we actually have a slot to present the results. And, um, and we also would like to propose an informal bar buff um, after the hackathon happy hour uh, tonight, um, meeting at 6 p.m. at uh, Island P stand, which is uh, run by uh, a colleagues of, of mine uh, from St. Andrews University. Um, and I will announce it again um, when we present the results. So we're looking for reviews from the group. Uh, we're looking for feedback from testers, users, developers, test you know, uh, developers, um, and generally from a sound uh, engineering uh, folk. Uh, we believe we are at the place where we are ready to um, proceed more aggressively uh, forward. The code is very stable um, and would like to make it uh, uh, a, you know, a concluded work in the, within the workgroup and, and get to the point where, where we can uh, make it a workgroup plus call. And um, would like to ask everybody uh, to help us to make it whole. Now, there is one other thing. I've been asked to read a section from the RFC at the end of the presentation. I can see Carsten has a, has a question. So Carsten, if you bear with me for 45 seconds. The second paragraph in the acknowledgement section is uh, reading a special wholehearted gratitude and thanks to late Al Morton for his thorough reviews filled with very specific feedback and constructive guidelines. Thank you all for the close collaboration over the years, for your continuous unwavering encouragements full of empathy and positive attitude. Al, you are dearly missed. Thank you. I think we have a question. Yeah, thank you, Manchu. Uh, Carson, you can. Ah. Here. Yeah, thanks. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> great, great note about L. I remember yes, I like. the last ITF meeting in Prague together with L. So, kind of memories. Yeah. Um, okay, so one comment and one question. Mm -hmm. So, the comment is I still, I mean, okay, first, excellent that the work is. 
continuing after all of this time. It's a little bit like our NetSec open uh, next gen firewall draft, which also came to an end after quite some years. So um, to me, it always sounded like software and, and virtualized environments need much longer test durations. Mm -hmm. Because if you test for a few seconds only, you're likely to miss some of these infrequent events that tend to happen in not so perfect implementations. Yep. And I think if we have perfect implementations, we don't need MLR search, search so much. We need it more for the less perfect implementations. So, so that would be my comment to, it's probably not influencing the draft itself, but maybe it would be worth to have like an implementation note or a comment in the draft to say like, be careful when testing for two short durations, like a few seconds only, is very likely to uprank incorrectly bad implementations, which have outages only once every few minutes. I think that's an excellent, excellent comment. And uh, maybe two, two quick answers for me, and I also let uh, Vratko uh, uh, comment. So it comes down to the DUT and SUT. Uh, even the most superb and perfect software running in a shared environment um, um, that cannot be, you know, isolated um, with, you know, and there are ways to get close to be isolated, tickless kernels and things like that. And we've been doing it for, for, for a while. But the reality is those COTS servers are shared. And it's understanding the behavior in those shared environments is what we want to address. Now, if you read the draft, there, there is a the MLR search comes with a set of parameters and with a certain settings, which I guess we need to qualify or quantify with a working group. You can get results that are compatible with RFC 2544. Um, so that's the, that's the test duration part that you have referred to, that testing for a few seconds may not be representative to the actual behavior long term. Uh, so that's the two, two comments. Ratko, do you, do you want to uh, add to what I said? I think uh, I will just repeat uh, this uh, idea of noiseless end of the spectrum and noiseful uh, end of the spectrum. Uh, noiseful end uh, is uh, dominated by infrequent, uh, by but... Uh, uh, high impact uh, effects uh, that are uh, able to cause some packet drop even if uh, at a relatively low loads. So if uh, a user is interested uh, in this part of the spectrum, yeah, give uh, strict uh, inputs. So uh, zero ratio loss uh, as a goal and uh, give it a uh, long uh, trial duration and uh, zero exit ratio, and this uh, way you get uh, the search that focuses on these rare events. But uh, that is only part of the users. Other part of the users want to focus on the other end of the spectrum, and they will choose opposite uh, configurations. And uh, MR search is even able to find the results uh, in the same search for both ends. Right, but don't forget such a draft, if, we, if it becomes an RC, and if I guess you don't want to supersede RC 2544, but you want to amend it. To augment, 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 correct. It, okay, but uh, forget it's, it, don't forget it's not only a scientific effort, it also has an effort, uh, an influence on the industry. So often in our testing life, we are confronted with vendors who re require that we test according to RFC 2544. And then we have to argue very hard that we use different packet sizes, for example. And if, if you write something into MLR search, like, oh, seven seconds is a good timing a duration, then likely the industry, especially those vendors that are not at par with you know, the best in the industry, uh, they will likely say, you, we require you to test for only seven seconds and that result is normative, right? And uh, that will uprank the bad implementations incorrectly. So C don't forget yeah. that. Carson, so I, I'll quote Patterson and Hennessy again, okay? For better or worse, the benchmarking shapes the field. That's why we don't want to do it, you know, we, we have an implementation and we want to standardize it within this working group. And we need help and feedback from everybody in the group, including you representing the independent labs. Okay. And, in and in fact, I would say, I don't know whether it's a, it's a normal behavior, but you know, we've been working together on and off for years. We value what you and the team do, influencing industry in different, in different forums, including, including this one. So um, 
you know, it's, it's democracy, but will definitely give you a, vet, a, a veto uh, a right for the uh, for the draft. We want to make sure that you are happy with what is here because you you are exposed to those multiple vendors and variety of implementations. So. Um, I think one of the values we see in MLR search is that it is configurable. So there is a set of input parameters. Um, we just need to make sure that they are very well understood, uh, they were very well defined, very well specified, very well understood, and recognized as, as valid. Um, for now, um, I think the first input that we need, and we want to really harden it, is the problem statement the approach taken, and then go into the, into the specification. The specification part and documentation part, it requires work. So have you noticed we are not asking for work group last call? <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, um, but actually, if that is the call to action to make, to, to get us you know, support from the work group in terms of reviewers and people who care, uh, sure, we can call for, for last call. But I don't think we're there yet. But we need definitely more eyeballs, more, more focused minds on that, on the on the problem itself, and also the approach, the approach taken. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I will. I would lock the queue because otherwise okay. there is no time for. Uh, maybe we can continue the discussion on the list. Yeah. Uh, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ten minutes is okay. Uh, it was twenty for this one and ten for the next. Okay. Sales like twenty, twenty for this 20. one and for the next. So hello, I hope that you can hear me, and I'm happy that to be here. This is the first time I'm here in person. Many of you know my name, but it is the first time in person, and I'm happy that I can see your face and meet you in person. So, uh, uh, unlike uh, the previous draft, I would like to ask uh, Working Group last call, so please uh, listen carefully if, if everything is okay with our draft or not. If not, then please say not. <laughs> okay, so the title is Benchmarking Methodology for Stateful NATXY Gateways Using RFC uh, 4814 Turner Board Numbers. May I use this one? Yeah. Ford? Yeah, it works. <clears throat> Super. So just a one slide summary of our goals. So we'd like to, to give you a benchmarking methodology uh, following the old RFC 25, 44, 51, 80, and uh, 82, uh, 19 series. Uh, how to benchmark stateful uh, NATXY gateways. The problem is that it is a stateful thing and with bidirection traffic, it, it is a problem to, to benchmark them. So first of all, we would like to make it possible to, to perform the classic uh, tests like throughput, frame loss rate, and latency, package reversion, and etc. And uh, we want to add some further performance metrics like maximum connection establishment rate, connection teeth round it, and connection tracking table capacity to measure the stateful parts of the uh, thing. And uh, we have to take special, special care to the RFC 4814 certain port numbers. Of course, uh, they are problematic in both sides. So if, if uh, we just use personal num numbers in one direction, in a stateful case, you just uh, input a lot of connections to the connection ring table and it exhausts its capacity. In the other direction, if you just invent certain port numbers, they just packets which don't belong to any connection, they will get dropped and the test fails. So it's really a problem. So the progress of the draft is partially here. Uh, we, are, we believe we're coming to the end of this uh, progress. And for today, I just brought a few examples about the validation of the methodology because we believe it works well now. And I just brought a few slides as a reminder Perhaps you, many of you have already wrapped and knew, know the methodology, but maybe some of you not. So I just give a short summary of using a few slides about the main, the highlights of the draft. So here is an example. Uh, our methodology works with any IP versions on both sides, but the example uses stateful NAT64. So on the left side, 
I'm not sure if it, this is Blazor for Intel, it works. I cannot see. It should see. be the top button, but often on LCDs, they don't because they're just. Ah. Yeah. It works there, but not on. OK. OK. I no problem. But I, I will just um, tell you where to, where to look. So uh, there are two, two devices, the tester and the device under test. On the left side of the tester, uh, we use IP version 6. And the right side, we use IP version 4. And on the left side, uh, we call this initiator because it can initiate new connections. It sends some IP version 6 packets with certain port numbers and IP addresses. And it goes through a device under test. It does the stateful NAT64 translation. It stores the connections in the connection tracking table. And it emits uh, IP version 4 packets, which arrive back to the tester. And the tester, its uh, part is called responder. It collects the four tuples. I mean, source and destination IP addresses, source and destination uh, port numbers. And it stores in its state table. And using them from the state table, of course, by swapping source and destination, it will be able to, to send valid packets, which are IP version 4 packets that belong to an existing connection in the connection tracking table, and they can be translated back to version 6. So uh, the measurement works in two phases. Uh, there's phase 1, which serves two purposes. Uh, the connection tracking table of the device under test is filled, and the state table of the responder is filled with valid four tuples. This is the condition to be able to, to send packets in the reverse direction. I mean, uh, we need bidirection traffic uh, because RFC 2544 requires that. And this first test phase can be used without a real second phase just to measure the maximum connection establishment rate. And it must be, if, if, it, if phase two is used, it must be used together with phase one. And then the connections are present, and you can use the bidirectional traffic, and you can perform uh, all the classic tests through put frame loss rate, latency, packet deliberation, et cetera, et cetera, as defined in RFC 8219. So uh, to, to, to be able to repeat the measurement, uh, we uh, found two XM situations which, which can be simply ensured. The first XM situation is when all test frames create a new connection. And it's ideal for the connection, maximum connection establishment is measurement. And the other extreme situation when uh, the test frames not create a new connection, it is good for the classic test throughput and, and so on and so on. So uh, how can we achieve them? It's very simple. For uh, every uh, elementary test, we have to uh, uh, use a large enough and empty connection tracking table. Uh, and we use pseudorandom uh, enumeration of all possible port numbers which are limited uh, in the first phase, and we use a properly high timeout value. And then the, the uh, conditions are guaranteed. So as a proof of concept, uh, all measurements have been implemented in, in SIIT perf, and the source code is available under a, a, a open source license. And to validate the methodology, the benchmarking tests were performed with three radically different stateful NAT64 implementations. The first one was Joule, which is a kernel space uh, NAT64 uh, stateful NAT64 implementation. The second one was a combination of Taiga, which is a user space uh, stateless NAT64 implementation, which combined with uh, IP tables, which is a, an uh, NAT44, stateful NAT44 implementation. And the third one was a radically different one. It was OpenBSD PF, which is a packing filter of OpenBSD. So the, the, the aim was that if the methodology has some flows, perhaps it will not work with different implementations because we just relied on one implementation and hopefully it turned out it's, there's a problem. So this was the measurement environment. There were two there are servers interconnected by uh, 10 gigabit uh, links with direct cables. And one of them is a tester and the other is a device under test as shown in the previous uh, figure. And here are the results. So. Uh, uh, besides those things which I uh, shared, there's a very important issue, this is scalability. Uh, there are two kinds of scalabilities. One of them is scalability with the number of CPU cores. Uh, of course, you know that uh, currently the uh, clock frequency of the CPUs cannot be raised, but they increase the number of CPU cores. And we would expect that uh, adding more cores increase the performance of the system. So it is critical to check if it is so or not. 
So in this case, uh, the measured value was the maximum connection in segment 28 was Joule, and uh, we tested it by one, two, four, eight, and 16 CPU cores, always doubling the number of cores to cover a, a wide range with a low number of measurements. And error is just the uh, difference of the higher bound and upper bound of the uh, binary search when we stop. Of course, we can do it until one, but we just wanted to save some time. And uh, we repeated all the tests 10 times, and median, minimum, maximum were calculated. And you can see that minimum, maximum are quite close to median, so the results were quite stable. And you can see the scalability here, uh, that from one core to, to two core, two cores, we, the performance increased by uh, 59%. And again, we used eight cores, so sorry, for four cores instead of two cores, increase was uh, 27%. But after that, the increase was much lower. So the scalability was yeah, acceptable, not, not very good, but moderate. And this was a, a specific test for stateful metric. And on the next slide, I can show you the throughput. The same settings, but it's not the throughput. In the second phase, it was measured with bidirectional traffic, and the number of all packets are displayed here. So we can see similar trends that up to four cores, the scalability was quite good or acceptable, but after that, practically no, no scale up. It was a classic uh, performance metric. And you can uh, see the other part of scalability, which is even more critical in the case of stateful uh, implementations. And usually people say that this is a problem of the stateful things, that if we increase the number of connections, they will not scale up well. So uh, to cover a wide range with a low number of measurements, we uh, increased tenfold the number of connections. So first four, uh, 400,000 and then 4 million and 40 million connections. And you see it was achieved by increasing the number of source ports numbers, uh, the destination port numbers and the source port numbers were kept uh, fixed. And again, you can see that there's some degradation. You can see first a 23% and then 26% degradation, but I think it is acceptable. So if we increase the tenfold, it's not so bad, but it's the property of Joule. Uh, what is re uh, relevant for us now it works. And of course it was the maximum connection establishment rate. Now you can see throughput, they show quite similar tendencies. So the lesson to learn is that measurement work well. And of course, just as a demonstration, we included results for the latency and as required by RFC 8219, it's not only we send one packet as in RFC 2544, but we send at least 500 packets and calculate uh, the typical and worst case latencies and median, minimum, maximum were computed in 20 repetitions of the test. It's nothing special to be seen here. They are as expected, stable and work well. And of course, the PDV was also uh, performed. IPDV is an optional test, it was not supported by SIIT perf, but it's just some programming work to, to, to also implement that one. And uh, frame loss rate is just uh, interesting for us because uh, it shows that frame size doesn't really matter. Of course, it's not a surprise because uh, stateful ND64 is a header manipulating technique. So uh, Joule is implemented in kernel space. So just uh, transmitting uh, the packet, the rest of the packet, the payload, it's not, not, a big, big, not a big deal through the 10 gigabit Ethernet. So it doesn't, it, frame size doesn't really influence the performance. And something interesting, it was something special, again, specific to stateful testing. It is the connection teardown rate. So a connection setup is one end and the connection teardown is the other end when we tear down the connections. Unfortunately, we can measure it only as an aggregate measurement. It means that we insert a number of connections into the connection tracking table of the, of the device under test and then delete the entire uh, connection tracking table. We did it with some out of band method. In fact, in case of Joule, we just removed the kernel module and measure the time by it lasted. And you can see here that if we increased the number of uh, connections tenfold, uh, the, the deletion time also increased. <laughs> and to be more uh, accurate, 
we also deleted the empty uh, connection tracking uh, uh, table. It means that we just measured the time of the removal of the module, and it also included the, the, the communication latency. So, of course, it, it is uh, the same in all three cases, and we uh, subtracted that from the first value. And in the first case, as these two uh, uh, values were classed close to add each other, so the result is uh, uncertain. But in the second and third case, uh, the connection teardown ratio is quite constant. So, uh, I told you first that we used three different implementations, Joule, Tiger plus IP tables, and OpenBSD PF. And it's, it was really so, but it didn't have time for including all the measurement results. But this open access paper, which is currently published, contains all the results. So if you are interested, you can, you can check them. And we thank for NICT Japan that I could be there for six months to, to achieve these results, and also for NITC Tilebed that they uh, let me to use uh, the resources, the, the servers. So, as I mentioned before, we'd like to ask for a working group last call, and it boils down to two questions. Do you have any questions or concerns to be addressed before it can be published, and do you support the progress of this draft to be published as an informational RFC? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gabor. Let's see if there are comments or questions. Of course, people can raise points on the list. <laughs> and for working group plus call, uh, as also mentioned in the chair slide, we will do after the IOTF. Okay. okay. Thank you. So let me do next. I think I will be the next one too. Yeah. So this is a brand new draft, uh, zero, 00 version. and. In fact, this uh, came from the uh, experience with the previous one, because uh, we experienced that with OpenBSD, uh, we just uh, got some poor results, and we investigated the case, and we come to the conclusion that uh, not only with stateful, but also with stateless tests, there's point in uh, using multiple IP addresses in benchmarking. So now we'll propose an, an, a new draft, and uh, some kind of amendment of the RFC 2544 and RFC uh, 4814 uh, methodologies. So first of all, the, uh, what I talk about is the first is the problem description, why I believe that we need testing with multiple IP addresses, and then the recommended solution, uh, how we can do it. So the program description. Of course, you uh, remember that uh, RFC 2544 just uh, defined the test frame format. It contained fixed IP addresses and fixed port numbers. It meant that the manufacturers of the test devices could resend always the very same test frames. It was very convenient. However, then came RFC 4814, which required using of pseudonym port numbers. But in the case when of course, RFC 2544 required testing with one IP address pair first and then using uh, 256 destination networks, uh, choosing pseudonymly. But when only a, a single destination network is used, it caps using a single IP address pair. And also came receive site scaling, which makes it possible to receive multi million uh, packets by, let's say, a, a Linux server or any device using multiple CPU cores. And it has two kinds of implementations. The first thing, one of them is that uh, when all, both IP addresses and both port numbers are included in the hash function, which is used to, to hash the interrupt to CPU cores. And the second implementation is a bit simpler. It yeah, just uses the IP addresses, source and destination IP addresses, don't use the port numbers in the hash function, which maps the interrupts to the CPU cores. And here comes the problem which is the problem of unfairness. So if we use RFC 4814 pseudonym port numbers together with the first RSS implementation, there's no problem. It works perfectly because the port numbers just uh, give some entropy. However, if we use RFC 4814 pseudonym port numbers together with the second kind of RSS implementation, it gives poor results because no entropy, because uh, 
I, the port numbers are not used, and there are no, no multiple IP addresses. And usually it means that if you use bidirectional traffic, only two CPU cores are used, one for one direction and one for the other direction, and the others are just relaxed and don't do anything. However, if we use these boxes in uh, forwarding internet traffic, they work perfectly because they have different IP addresses and uh, there's an entropy and everything works back. So it means that there's a gap and which we have to fill in to make the elaborated test conditions better to uh, approximate better the uh, conditions of, of internet traffic. So the idea is very, very simple. It's just to apply the idea of RFC 4814, which recommended multiple and pseudonym port numbers, which should use multiple and pseudonym IP addresses. And there are two questions. What ranges can be used and what ranges should be used? So the first has some problem in IP version 4 because the ranges are quite narrow, which were reserved for benchmarking in IP address 4. Um, but in IP uh, uh, version 6, there's no, no, no such problem. So here's when only the destination and networks are fixed. We have only the last eight bits to uh, express uh, different uh, addresses. But when we don't use uh, multiple uh, networks, we can use the last 16 bits. So it's not, not a real program. And of course, with IP version 6, we have plenty of enormous range. So there's no, no such problem. And the other thing is what ranges should be used. On the other hand, it's natural that we should use as many as possible because it can give a lot of entropy and it can hash properly. However, if we use too many, it uh, may have this downside because uh, of the NDP or, or RP tables. And if there are too many elements in that, uh, and if we use uh, more than a few thousands of them, maybe the performance will be degraded and I have experienced that. So we should have a good recommendation, which I don't have yet. So there's a working code, which I implemented. You can test it if you want. And my question, if, if you agree that problem at all exists, and do you think that this proposal solves the problem? And if you have any ideas, suggestions, I'm, I'm really happy if, if you can share it. Thank you. Comment. <laughs> Comments. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's okay. We'll just <laughs> So, can you go back to the problem statement? Yes. I try. This one. The one about RSS, where it says one is perfect, one is not. Uh, uh, this, is, this is, it is explained which RSS, and it is, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So with the first RSS implementation, when the, can you go back? So yeah. the, the, when the entropy when, is actually on port numbers. Yes, I just it's, it's fine, try to right? click. Yeah, oh, OK, it clicked. OK. So the first, it's fine. Everything is fine because of the port numbers are pseudo random. So you are, you're going after the second type? Yes. The problem is with the second, yes. How common is the second type? Well, I don't know. I met with that uh, in the case of OpenBSD, and I'm not sure if the, any small devices, how, how they implement it. I have no idea. Most, most NICs today do the port numbers and protocols, tunneling protocols use that for mm -hmm. entropy. Um, so that's one just comment. Um, mm. The second one, if you go to the addressing, IPv4, uh, uh, where you say that there is something reserved for yeah. here the, or, or uh, this not one? the previous one, yeah, yeah. So the slash the slash fifteen is reserved, but in the lab you can use anything, any yeah. addresses, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, synthetic tests in the lab um, are synthetic, but they should aim to. Uh, approximate or estimate the actual target deployments. Yes. Right. So ideally, use the ranges that are used uh, depending on how the system works. So that's the the the, the two comments. Um, however, <laughs> the problem of um, using address ranges 
versus what is defined in RFC 2544, I find it interesting and, uh, and, and, and novel. And the question is, you know, is that something that we want to standardize or at least provide some uh, recommendations or directions uh, towards in terms of how the IP address ranges and port numbers are used for benchmarking various solutions. Your, your work came from the NAT, I guess, from the stateful testing. Yeah, but I, I met with the, the, the problem during the net testing, yeah. but it, it happens also when I do router testing. So when I measured OpenBSD, uh, the single is, is called multiprocessor or uh, single processor kernel, and yeah. multiprocessor kernel was not really better than single processor yeah. kernel. So, so, yeah, so, so the question is, you know, how prescriptive we should be in defining the, the benchmarks. You know, we, we're going with MLR search to augment RFC 2544, you, uh, to address a certain problem class, um, you are going also to augment yeah. RFC 2544 to address another problem class. I think they're, they're so orthogonal, they, I mean, but maybe used I, together. They are, they are they're for, for sure, for sure, for sure. So validating the problem statement is first, but I find it interesting. And it Thank would be you. good to actually, even as an informative, to have directions to the benchmarking labs on how to go about uh, testing flows and sessions with address ranges and port ranges. So I like, I like the idea. I'm not sure I'm sold on the problem statement as you articulated, but I, I find, it, find it interesting. So we'll connect offline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Vratko. Uh, yeah, uh, just a short comment about uh, what we have seen in uh, CSIT. Uh, in CSIT, we are already using uh, multiple flows. Uh, so uh, on the SUT input and output, uh, we are already fine, but uh, we have some older tests, uh, mostly related to various uh, technologies that encapsulate flows like IPSEC and uh, others. And uh, sometimes uh, when the test uh, is using en encapsulated flows that are not different enough for RSS, RSS to distinguish, we, hit, we see similar problems, like cores not used fairly. And uh, yeah, but that is a test design problem. And uh, the other issue is uh, when we focus on a, a trending, like comparing uh, different builds uh, of the uh, same software, it is important that the results are repeatable, but with some mix, some drivers, the RSS key is not constant, it is random. And sometimes when you have bidirectional traffic, you do not get, get two cores working, you get only one core receiving all, both encapsulated flows. So then you see uh, fake regression and progression. And uh, that is the main reason in CSIT we really try hard to have multiple flows, even if they are encapsulated. Thank you. I, I, Thank you. I'd point out for ACO though, that, that at some point as a tester, you can't control the, the system under test. And so if as an implementation, it chooses to use one core or multiple cores, as a tester, if I don't know that, I think it leaves you with that, that dilemma that we run into sometimes in BMWG around, do you design the test for the test or, or for the for the SUT because you know the architecture? Um, in general, we usually lean towards writing for the test in the sense that, look, you might as a vendor know your architecture well, but you don't know every other architecture on the market. And so trying to write for the architecture makes that hard. And so as a tester, I think just noting that this is what you observed and here's why you think that might be happening is uh, is usually the way we've handle that J just a comment not a, a a yes or a no to, to what you said thank you gabor do you want to comment because i no, have no, two comments okay so firstly to ratko's uh, point uh ratko thank you for reminding me um i think if we if if we go ahead with this work uh we should also include the rss part and specifically the rss key that is used to hash flows because there are multiple implementations in the market, in the software networking, especially for the for the NICs. And if this key is randomized at boot time, um, repeatability may be impacted. So I think that's a, a good comment. Uh, Sarah, to your point, um, I think in software networking, we definitely uh, are paying attention to the resources used, specifically CPU cores, logical cores, physical cores. These are not closed systems, these are open systems. And it is by configuration that one can enable one or multiple cores. 
flow distribution into those scores is a very important aspect of um, benchmarking any software networking system. So I partially agree with what you said that you know we designed the test to, to test a generic type of DUTs or SUTs. However, those DUTs and SUTs are configurable. In hardware, you don't usually specify the resources. In software, you do. So um, again, partially agree and treat it as a, as a comment. But I think this, this conversation is, uh, is a very good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the clarification and refinement. I'll, I'll blame it being 1.45 a.m. I, I agree, Magic. If you can, as a tester, configure what you've got, uh, absolutely, then I think it's fair to do so. I was absolutely thinking of closed hardware systems. So I agree with your point. And I agree with your larger point. I think it's really nice to have this conversation in general because I think in the past, BMWG has stayed very firmly in the 2544 era of, you know, let's not take this stuff on. But I think since, at least across the 10 years that I've been here, also to your point, Magic, with the software defined everything changing how we look at the testing world, I think we need to evolve and having this conversation as a working group makes a lot of sense. So a big plus one to your comments, Magic, and a big plus one to the work that you're presenting, Recon. I'm really excited to see it in the, the room. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for bearing with us at such an early or late time for you in California. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, feel bad for me. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Yiming Ngoc, and uh, I will uh, present our consideration for benchmarking networking performance in Conrad infrastructures. This is our latest uh, updates from the previous meeting. So our newest versions uh, have the updates based on the IETF on one seven meeting commands and uh, about requesting clear draft scope and about the previous unrest review from Raco and Gables in previous reviews they have given to our draft. So the new section is the new scope section where we uh, specify the clear scope of our draft. And uh, the new, another new one is we specify new benchmarking parameter according to each container resource configuration consideration. And uh, the minor thing inside the change is something that we merge and remove from the previous one. So the first thing we merge duplicate information in the container right infrastructure overview section and the introduction section in prior version into one single system now is the introduction one. And the second thing is you remove the band matching appendix at the bottom of the previous uh, version. So these are the detail of each update. So the first is the scope. So the ITF one and seven meeting commands that uh, people want to see a clear scope of the draft and a clear difference again the previous work. So the relative work of this draft is IFC 8172 and IFC 8204. So uh, the primary scope of our document is to fill in the gaps of previous one. So when we apply the main machine course in the previous one to the continual right NFP infrastructure, and the gaps here are the different network and model topologies configured by continual network interface, especially especially in previous one, haven't mentioned about the extend Berkeley packet filter, the EBPF model. And uh, the second, the resource of recent part resource configuration for containers. And as you see in the picture, uh, there's a detailed networking model and uh, the resource configuration that we mentioned inside our draft. Uh, second thing is specifying new benchmarking parameters. So we so clear which are the parameters are new to uh, compare with the previous one. So for CPU isolation and NUMA affinity, so the new ones are the selected CPU isolation level and the new NUMA calls are located into the port. And we have, we have the port Hubert site, and we have the port CPU call location and DRAM allocation. And for the service function chaining uh, consideration, then we need to consider the number of CNN and port inside the chain and the selected CNI platform. 
for the merge and the remove one, then to address rascal comments about grouping introduction and continuous one. So we just merge the duplicate information into one in introduction and about the benchmarking results. So in previous section, we include the kind of result inside our draft to just add the proof of concept to uh, so that our proof of consideration are reliable when developing the draft. So after several updates and uh, it's having a stable one, then the information we remove it to avoid any kind of uh, misunderstanding. So that's it is uh, all our update. So we think that we have addressed the comment after several reviews. So we would like to ask for the adoption of the draft, the working draft, working group draft again. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for addressing all the comments. And uh, there are questions, inputs from the uh, room. <laughs> you cannot, okay, how you do? <clears throat> We also have the other book by by you can go first. Hi, th thanks very much for presenting the work and uh, for all the work. Uh, I think Vratko has already provided comments related to the specifics of the of the benchmarking. I just wanted to to make a comment. Um, we tried to do the containerized uh, network functions testing in the past, and I think we even still do in the project and and also in the LFN. Uh, FDIO project and, and other projects. One thing that we usually face or struggle with is um, repeatability, but not rep repeatability of the results. That's that's the separate thing we already talked about. But repeatability of the environment setup, and specifically related to orchestrating the life cycle of this containerized workloads. And um, we had few attempts using Kubernetes and some open source projects, and uh, they were moving. Too fast, some 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 folded. So, just a comment that, and I don't know whether you already have a section in there or not, and if it is important. But having a some sort of guidance or reference to how the environment is set up or orchestrated uh, in a repeatable fashion, so that the multiple labs um, can set up this containerized networking functions for for data plane in a repeatable manner. I think that would be that would be useful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just would, would like to express my support that I think it's what you've done is important and interesting. I, I don't think it's ready, but it's 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 yeah. worth of doing. So yeah. I support its adop adoption. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah, actually I, I did the same. I didn't say that's firmly, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you for the feedback. Who is uh, who is just at the mic expressing their uh, support? Um, Mashek again, Gabor, express support. Oh, I'm sorry, Mashek, I didn't recognize you. Pardon me. When uh, when folks come to the mic, could you say your name when you when you come in? It'll help with the notes and it'll help your co-chair who's apparently still waking up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it possible to get a show of hands on who has seen or read the? The draft, I, I'm gathering that some folks have that I hadn't caught on list, which is good. I'm just wondering if we could take a quick gander at who, who has read the draft. Yeah, I can start a show ends now. Should have a thirty thing or a raise hand thing. Sorry, it's a little bit. Now all right, so I'm seeing some folks have read it, which is perfect. And, and I realize that Giuseppe probably covered this at the top of the, the call on the chairs deck, but folks having everybody reading the presentations and reading the, the drafts and sharing feedbacks is, is helpful um, when you do it for others. Of course, when you submit a draft, uh, others do it for you. So 
Thank you. I see seven folks have have uh, raised their hands. Perfect. I appreciate the the support. Um, <clears throat> just to follow up, I think we should uh, close out, and and there seems to be support in the room. So let's take it to the list afterwards to ask for adoption for the draft and codify the results there. Sure. Yeah, we can continue the discussion on the list, of course. Perfect. Thank you. Paolo. So hello, Paolo Volpato, away I'm presenting the draft on the benchmarking of uh, segment routing MPLS based on behalf of the authors you see listed on first slide. So let me move to the next one. is not working. Shit harder. <laughs> Do I? Maybe. Nope. I nope. guess we'll just try. I guess you just shout out next slide and we'll. Uh, okay. Go. Good. So uh, very quickly, something that we have already presented in the past, you know that segment routing uh, leverages the source routing paradigm and you can implement uh, uh, segment routing on two different data planes. So MPLS, which is the subject of this draft and uh, IPv6, which is the subject of the next draft that will be presented by Edward uh, in a few minutes. Um, we have already highlighted that as of today, we don't have a standard method to benchmarking uh, segment routing. So there is something, the base for our work, which is RFC uh, 5695, which is the benchmarking of, uh, I would say, plain MPLS. Uh, we just needed to uh, leverage on uh, 5695 to make, you know, uh, evolve the benchmarking methods. Uh, we have to take into consideration all the uh, um, standards you see listed here, not just 5695, but all the standard uh, related to the benchmarking of a uh, networking device. Uh, based on that, we have implemented a draft that we are discussing right now. Let's see if now it works. Uh, apparently not. Jeff, please, can you move forward? Okay. Uh, update from the last IETF. So uh, probably you remember that uh, um, we presented and discussed a version 0, 06 of the draft. And that was the subject, I would say, of several discussions, both at ITF 116 and 117. Um, let's say that we had to, to cope with the different comments received both from the list and from the uh, microphone at the different ITFs. Um, since then, we published uh, version 07, which was a sort of keep alive edition, and uh, in October, version 08. So just to, let's say, um, mention what we did. Uh, first, uh, we, uh, let's say, um, took seriously a comment that Kasten um, raised at the last ATF on the mic. So uh, to avoid to have too many references in the draft. Uh, otherwise, reading the draft uh, and trying to understand and implement the different tests, uh, you had to also read uh, the associated documentation. So to read the other uh, drafts specifying details of the different tests. So we decided to, uh, let's say, incorporate as much text as possible into uh, the uh, SRMPLS relevant draft. Uh, so that we have a, a sort of standalone document. You can read it and have almost all the details. There is one exception, which is the uh, discussion around the buffering uh, uh, tests, but simply because the text uh, in RFC uh, 9004 is too long. Otherwise, we have uh, uh, to copy and uh, paste, uh, I would say, too many pages of text. Um, thanks to the, the work done by uh, Bruno, uh, we have decided to remove also some duplicated text, which was, uh, I would say, useless in the description of uh, how SRMPLS works. And also, uh, we decided to extend uh, 
let's say, uh, the discussion around, um, about the, um, the throughput test. And you see that in the next slide. Uh, because there are some implications, not just for the determination of the throughput of the device under test, but also on how the throughput could be impaired by the death of the protocol stack. So we decided to, let's say, um, enlarge the scope of the discussion and also better specify that uh, whenever we discuss uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, um, specific tests about SRM PLS, the, um, the death of the protocol stack should be, uh, let's say, um, clearly stated. And in the draft, you see that, for example, we decided to um, always recommend at least two labels, meaning two seats, using the language of a segment routing. But um, also, uh, let's say, add that uh, it is recommended to repeat at least some of the tests using more labels, so more than two, uh, which is also means uh, uh, more than two seats. Uh, you see here the description of the, um, the throughput, the forwarding benchmarking test. So we have to uh, take into consideration that modern uh, networking gear are so powerful. They can support such a, a huge throughput that in some cases, you need more than one test test to perform the actual test. So we have to combine you know, the, the setup and decide how many ports you need, how to distribute the workload across the different ports. Um, so that's the simple design that we have taken from uh, the text of the draft. Um, and the point here is how you determine the, something that we already discussed uh, uh, this morning. So the, uh, the zero frame loss test. So you keep on raising the throughput until you detect that you are um, about to discard some packets. So that's the point where you determine that we have uh, uh, overcome the zero frame loss, uh, let's say, threshold. Um, you have clearly to repeat the test using different throughputs, but there is also the other axis we have to consider. So um, the number of the labels you use uh, to actually do the test. So um, that's why we have decided to uh, put into the discussion around this specific test that uh, uh, it should be performed multiple times, uh, highlighting the number of labels, or again, the number of seats uh, you are using. Actually, one, one caveat, uh, that is applicable also to the other tests, but probably for the forwarding benchmarking, this is specifically useful. So that's why uh, specifically Bruno, one of the co-authors uh, asked to do, let's say, uh, or better to explain clearly that a, a specific protocol uh, uh, stack should be highlighted. So that, I think we can move to the next one. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so, so that. We believe that now the text uh, is stable enough. So as we uh, asked for uh, at the ITF 117, uh, we believe that the text is ready for uh, uh, working group adoption. So we are here again to ask to the chairs uh, if this is clearly possible, if there's the right, the right time to ask for that. Um, uh, you remember, that Sarah asked during the ATF 117 sort of rough indication uh, about what's the opinion of the audience. And uh, according to the messages we have received uh, on the mailing list, uh, apparently we are there. So I would say that's probably the right time to ask to the chairs if this is really happening. So uh, if the working group is ready to support that. And uh, um, let me also stress what we uh, discussed the past time. Having working group adoption means that, you know, the drafts are more visible. So probably uh, we are also, how can I say, uh, ready to, um, to involve the industry, have the support of third parties that maybe are also available or willing to actually do the tests on a specific device and uh, see if what we have prepared is really applicable, is really valuable. So that, I would say, this is it. Okay. I don't know if there is there any comments, questions. Comments from the room. Okay. You can, but. 
Can you try with yeah. you raise your hand? Hi, Mangabur. Could you go back to the slide where you, it shows two testers? This one? Okay. Yes, thank you. So I have a concern regarding this slide because for me, a tester is an autonomous device which can decide if uh, it raises or lowers the rate. And if there are two independent testers, it may happen that uh, one of them uh, senses loss because those ports produce some loss and the other ports there is no loss. So one of them will raise and will lower. So I would, I would suggest a different drawing which would be a big tester that complies or comprise of, of, of several uh, physical testers, and there's one logic which controls all the testers. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. yes, good point. Uh, clearly, those are not completely independent. Otherwise, you're right. You may lose the configuration of one of the two, but actually, it's a good suggestion, so we will uh, design Thank a different way the same drawing. Thank you. So, Maciej Konstantinovich, um, I didn't uh, read uh, the draft. I followed your presentation. I quickly scanned the draft. Um, <clears throat> I think you were referring to the RFC 5695 for MPLS label push pop swap and applying this to the SR MPLS uh, forwarding uh, paradigms. So, yep. that is cool. Yes. Um, the question I have is about uh, the intention of the, of the authors. Uh, segment routing provides much more than just MPLS push, pop, swap. And uh, in terms of the, the testing procedures, they're going to be similar in your draft as 5695, which you acknowledge. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you looking to evolve? So two questions. Are you looking to evolve this to test some things that are specific to segment routing in terms of different behavior? That's question one. Second, do we really need to have a separate drafts for SRMPLS and for SRV6. Okay. Behaviors, as you acknowledge in the first slide and in the draft, the architecture is defined, segment routing architecture is, is, is defined for both. It may be good if we drive both here too, unless you want to do it through the separate draft. So, mm -hmm. so two comments, thank you. Okay, so first question, um, yes, but I would say not for now, not for this version of the draft. So um, if you read the introduction, we have specified, we are benchmarking the, uh, how can I say, the, the basic uh, functionality of SRMPLS. For the advanced applications, let's wait maybe for another draft. We want to acquire first experience on what we are uh, describing here. Then uh, about the second question, that's something that we already discussed at the last ATF. So should we keep the two drafts, the one on SRMPLS and the other one on SRV6 uh, uh, separated? Um, we have spent quite some time discussing, let's say internally among the different authors, uh, um, whether to accept this idea or not. And I can tell you um, at the moment, uh, I mean, we, the, the, the five authors still think that having two drafts is better, uh, just to probably make things a bit more uh, clear, I would say. So keep the distinction between the two uh, data planes implementation. Um, that's our opinion so far. So it's, I would say, something even uh, easier for us to, let's say, make the two drafts evolve. It is true they are kept in sync when we um, look for a change or we have requested to add something, we double check both drafts. But after the work we have done from version six to version eight, as requested, we have started to see that probably keeping the two drafts separated is useful for us because we have started to see uh, something that is, I would say, peculiar of the two uh, different implementations. So that's why we'd like to keep them separated. That's it. Yeah, we have G. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Chi from ZGC Lab. And uh, uh, I have just two simple questions. Uh, firstly, do we have any um, new metrics for 4SR in, in, this, in this document? Yes, there is something, we have a large section four, which is the description of the different parameters you should uh, uh, 
um, take into consideration for the test. If you read it, you see that we have added something in addition to what 56.95 says. It's, if I remember correctly, a couple of parameters. I'm also looking to the other co-authors. It's not that much, but yes. Okay, so, and, and before work, working group adoption, I wonder, do we have any uh, available test results? Uh, I, I, I haven't seen that before. Right, right. That's a very good point. So we tried to do so, but at the moment we didn't, uh, uh, we, we were not successful in, uh, in having, you know, test results. But that's an open invitation. If anyone has something that shows some early results, we'd like to incorporate that into the two drafts. Okay, thanks. Karsten? So Karsten Rosner with ENTC. I would like to to uh, second Maciej's, Maciej's concerns, as I've said last time. So um, subsequent to ITF 117, I sent like a very detailed analysis of, of the comparison of the two drafts, and I proved that more than 90% of the text is identical. And um, so your response was like you have you discussed with the authors and you have the opinion you want to keep it separated. I would kindly ask for a substantiated scientific response, not mm -hmm. for an opinion response, because I think this, from my point of view, it's not ready for working group um, adoption unless we have sorted out this question. Okay. To me, it looks like somebody is aiming for having a higher number of drafts in <laughs> okay in the you know, whatever career. Yeah, yeah. So that is not a good motivation from my point of view. Okay. And also regarding what Maciek also already said, you know, I, when I looked at the, the actual heart of it, like the section which describes the test methodology, it really just says like test SR, like you've tested MPLS. So from ENTC's perspective, I would not be very inclined, very much inclined to trying out this draft because I think it lacks the incremental value so this is, mm -hmm. we have gone far beyond, if you look at our interop events, far beyond um, these kind of MPLS style tests. And also if you look at the performance tests that we've carried out with, with a couple of panels. Okay. Well, clearly I remember your comment uh, also the ATF 117, which stands right now. Um, okay. We take your comment, we'll elaborate more feedback on that, then we can decide. It's, it's yeah, exactly. For sure, uh, just to be clear, it's not uh, the, no, sorry, Master, please. <laughs> uh, it's not a matter of having more drafts in, in our record. So it's because we believe uh, it's better for us to keep them separated. But if one day we decide to merge them, it's okay, I mean, so. Yeah, yeah so Maciej Konstantinovic, uh, Cisco <laughs> and FDIO. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Karsten validated my observation. I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, uh, I did not read the, the draft. That's why my comment was just an observation, but I pretty much support uh, Karsten's uh, view that if there is, a, there is a duplication between the SR and PLS and SRB6 in the drafts, if you remember my time and power, uh, I think, you know, why don't we need to spend time reading, reading too. In terms of the added value versus just MPLS push, pop, swap, Again, it was an observation. Carson uh, validated that. Um, there are so many interesting things in segment routing mm -hmm. that uh, should be explored and um, working, you know, somebody like you taking it on and, um, and defining those use cases, um, I, I think is a valid, valid thing. So I would encourage you not to limit yourself to just the basic push, pop, swap uh, sure. replication. Thank you. Again, that's a very valid comment. And I'm not saying, uh, no, we will not take that in consideration. Let's work on the basic capability and leveraging on that, we can make the two drafts evolve, including more advanced yeah. functions. So just, just one last, last, very last comment. Uh, Maciej Konstantinovich, uh, Cisco and FDIO. We do run SRMPLS tests in FDIO. There are no, no standards. Uh, they, they are testing some behaviors. Okay. Um, you, you ask if somebody has results, or we're happy to provide pointers okay. to those results. That's but, great. But this is very early work. We haven't given it really required attention. Okay. So it's like a first attempt. We've been running those tests for the last three years. Thank right. you. Let's join forces. This is something we need. I hope. Um, okay. Done. Yeah, okay. well, Thank we you. can continue the discussion on this. And uh, I will move to the next one.
Ja. Eduard? Do you hear me? Ja. Oké, okay, fijn. I have, I have a compa companion <coughs> um, benchmarking test for SR SRV6 uh, benchmarking. Uh, please go next slide. Uh, the general stuff is the same, um, especially for SRV6. Uh, we don't have benchmarking test because SRV6 is principally different. It's uh, routing header in, in IPv6. It's uh, it, it may give different result from from SR, SRMPLS because it's really different data plane. Uh, we are based, of course, on RFC 2544. Of course, uh, additionally, we have paid a lot of attention to uh, SRMPLS and to IPv6 uh, benchmarking uh, RFC, which we have already and some some other rfc which is referenced here uh which plays attention in, including for example uh the recently de delivered speech by uh, gabor about the importance of uh, uh hash proper hash distribution we need to put some in our case uh, because uh, the hash could be based on, on seed for example uh the seed should have a uh, big enough distribution to, to to be properly run of course ap addresses too okay go next slide uh, probably it's not so much important to explain what is a service six. It's a, already more or less known technology, but what is important to mention, uh, it's important to mention, uh, partially it would be the answer to uh, previous questions, uh, the previous draft. Uh, we have decided, okay, it could be changed, no problem, but we have decided initially that we put uh, services like VPN services, because here we have not just VPN, here here we have much more than VPN. Um, here we have, for example, BSEED to stitch uh, different domains. Uh, of course, we have different type of, uh, of functions on every box. We have decided to put all these functions uh, out of the scope, because if we will put it inside, it would be a huge document. Hence, my request my response to Karsten, my response to uh, Masiek, if you have particular request, okay, because look, uh, a service six is huge number of uh, um, potential uh, services, potential functions. If you have um, um, request to include particular one, please be specific. Please tell us, okay, uh, please include, uh, I know, layer 2 VPN, layer 3 VPN, uh, EVPN, whatever. Because uh, in general, if you will try to insert everything, the document will go will go out of control. We could not insert everything which is available in the service six. It, it would be really really huge and unmanageable document and not everybody needs everything therefore please be specific if you need to add something please go to us and add some specific thing it's my answer to uh, expansion of number of functions go please go next document uh, the history probably only last point makes sense to mention uh, yeah we we did try, as Paul already stated in both documents, we did try to decrease number of references. Okay, okay, references are still there. We still keep references, no problem. But now we are trying to insert all relevant text from proper references uh, for person uh, no need to read uh, the relevant RFC, except of course uh, the buffer test, because for buffer test, oh, it's historically called back-to-back -back test, okay, buffer test. Uh, we were not capable to insert because after looking to this RFC, we have understood that to insert it, we need to really insert a lot. Uh, as a result, uh, the draft itself has uh, has become three pages longer. If you compare uh, version eight from six or seven, it would be three pages more. But three pages more probably is not a so big payment uh, to have almost almost everything in this document without need to jump between documents. Okay, go next slide. Uh, we have a few outstanding issues, as, as I would say, because just last minute, I mean one week before this ITF meeting, Bruno came to us with a few specific requests. He said that, okay, uh, in introduction and in general discussion about what is a service X, we have some duplication. And okay, fine, uh, we we promise to to uh, to to decrease this uh, to, to delete this duplication in, in the next version. We definitely will prepare version nine, where there would be no not so much duplication. Okay, fine. Additionally, um, uh, he has requested something new, something specific. He told us that 
okay, it makes sense to the TD flow la label ECMP support because look, if you will open SRV6 uh, SRH uh, specification, you will see that load balancing based on flow label is mandatory. In general, the PV6 is not mandatory, but specifically for SRH, for SRV6, flow label support is mandatory by, by RFC. And for that reason, uh, from his point of view, it makes sense to DD ECMP test. And uh, of course, if ECMP test would be added, it should be added uh, based on flow label. Okay, fine. It's a specific request and we have discussed internally and uh, agree, okay, we will add it this particular test, uh, the document will become a little bit more longer. Okay, fine. An additional request from his side was uh, that um, definitely it's well known that particular products from particular vendors has a restriction of number of uh, labels or seeds, which could be processed at the same time, number of seeds. And uh, Bruno would like to have this to be tested for every particular equipment because typically vendor claims something like, 10 seats in the list for one pass, or maybe in, RFC, in some RFC it stated that 16 should be supported. And Bruno asked us, okay, please DD uh, the test, which will reveal what is the real restriction of particular box. Okay, fine. It's a more or less a, a small request. Okay, it probably cost us one, two pages additionally to DD this, but okay, fine. Uh, no, no problem. We'll, we will DD. We have discussed internally and we decided uh, that it's uh, probably makes sense to DD. Please go next slide. Uh, in general, um, the core of the document is more or less stable. Okay, we have added some number of uh, references inside, but it's it's it does not change a lot. Uh, we we are ready to add uh, some particular things uh, if you would like, but again, it should be manageable. We could not add everything which a service X or SRMPLS is capable. Uh, Maybe I need to add one comment of my personal opinion, just, just my opinion, why these particular drafts should not be merged. Because I believe that people who will test this uh, will test only SRV6 or only uh, SRMPLS, not, not, not both at the same time. Because uh, typically it's a, it's a long, long discussion. It's a long pre-sales activity in, in every uh, telco uh, to choose what is the best for particular telco, SRV6 or SRMPLS. And after it's chosen, only after this, particular vendors would be tested and uh, particular vendors would be tested only for one. Therefore, if we will merge the documents, then people will need to bypass many things because many things would be not related to their situation because their situation would be or SRV6 or SRMPLS. And for that reason, I believe just for convenience for the people who would be doing really test, it's better to keep it separate. That's it from my side. Karsten, your time. I would suggest to be quick because I want to give space. Yeah, for just the very last quick. Person. So Karsten again. Um, one example of, of test areas for SR performance would be uh, compressed or micro sits, for example. Definitely, we should not add anything related to EVPN. That's not the point here. That would be out of scope. But you know, anything that's genuinely segment routing based, and maybe you've heard about the big discussion in the industry and in the ITF about compressed SIDs, that would be a, a very obvious topic for me in both. Uh, but Karsten, you know that compressed SIDs is not RFC yet. It's just a draft, right? You know. Yeah, your document is also a draft. Yeah, but look, uh, it may change, right? Uh, it's a little bit um, risky to be based on something which is still in discussion and may change. But okay, we will think it's, about it's, it. It's your call if you want to, but I would always encourage innovation, right? So we know that these documents stay in the draft state for quite some time. Yours is not even working group uh, adopted. So I would expect that it lives as a draft for the next minimum 18 months, if not much, much longer. And so by that time, for sure, I would say compressed SIDs will have become RFC. Okay, Karsten, accept compressed SID. What else? Please think and put in the email alias if you would like something else except compressed SID. Yeah, I, think we, I think we can continue on the list. Yeah. I would like to give the floor to Jackie. Thank you, Edward. No problem. Okay, so thanks, Dark. 
Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. This is Zerqi from Tsinghua University and the CDC lab. So it's very happy to come here. And this is my first time to present our work in person uh, in the BMWG. So today I'm going to introduce our recent work about our considerations for benchmarking and storage for reliable transport protocols in the integrated space and peripheral networks. So in our previous meetings, we have uh, described our some considerations for benchmarking the space networks, and we got very many valuable comments from the BMWG. For example, we need to uh, narrow down the scope, for example, to clarify, to clarify what we want to benchmark. And for example, we, want, uh, we hope we can strengthen our collaboration with our industrial partners. So uh, we make some modifications in this term, and this is why we propose these proposals. So, uh, sorry, uh, how to next page? Okay, so uh, this is the outline of my today's talk and let's start with the a short background and motivation. So as we all know, the satellite has been long been used for to provide the internet service in around the world. For example, we have many satellite operators for internet service, just like Vsat, HugeNet and uh, many others especially for those users in the remote or rural regions. So um, maybe in that, in that case, the terrestrial fibers might not be feasible. So uh, different from any other kinds of terrestrial networks, the satellite links have some unique characteristics. For example, um, because the satellites all, always are always operated in a very high altitude, for example, uh, 30, 39,000 kilometers, this will involve a significantly large propagation delay and extra packet loss for the underlying protocols. So the IETF has a range of RFCs discussing the benchmarking methodologies and the enhancement recommendations for transport protocols, such as the RFC uh, 6349. So next page, please. But in recent years, with the rapid development of the burst uh, uh, aerospace industry and the networking stack, both of them have evolved significantly in recent years. On one hand, the satellite networks have evolved from the traditional geo-satellite networks to the recent low Earth orbit satellite constellations, just like OneWipe, Starlink, and any other forms the uh, constellations. They can provide much lower latency as compared to its precedents in the geo orbit. On the other hand, the transport layer protocols also evolved significantly from the traditional TCP to the recent quick protocol, and also uh, look at the algorithms. For example, tradi traditionally we have the cubic, and recently we have more new algorithms such, such as the BBR for construction control. And then they evolved from the lost base to the delay based and the not, not mode based. That's please. So with this uh, trend, we believe that. Oh, sorry. Excuse no, me. Sorry. The previous one. <laughs> so with this chance, we believe that towards the emerging LEO satellite networks, which will carry a large fraction of internet traffic, a well-defined and reproducible benchmarking mass storage and performance indicators for transport, la transport layer protocols should be needed. Next, please. So this is why we uh, propose this draft and including uh, three aspects. So next, please. The first one is the test bed setup. So the goal of our test, test bed setup is expected to create, create an isolated benchmarking environment that can appropriately simulate the unique characteristics of the integrated space and territorial network, or we call it ISTN. So here is the ISTN characteristics. The first one is it has a very large scale constellation. For example, many recent proposed constellations will uh, include more hundreds to thousands of LEO satellites, just like Starlink. And second one is the frequent and the sudden packet loss, which are caused by many complex factors, just like the barrier prone space environments and the endless handover due to the continuous movement of LEO satellites. The third one is the dynamic end-to-end -end latency. Uh, this is due to the topology dynamics and the routing fluctuations. Next page, please. Hey, just a quick time check. We have one minute left and oh, we need 30 sorry, seconds sorry. to wrap. 
I'm okay. so sorry to rush you, please. <laughs> okay, so I will, I will uh, accelerate. Okay, sure. So here we propose a data-driven approach to build a test bed for IST. And the first step is to collect the realistic and public satellite trajectories, for example, from the open set data sets. Next page. And then we can exploit virtualization technologies to build a virtual ISTN environment in the lab environment. Next page. <laughs> and then to keep the fidelity, we can uh, configure each satellite link. For example, we can configure the loss and latency based on some real measurements. So this figure plus some recent measurement studies uh, from the real Starlink satellite network. Here we can see the uh, virus in the RTT round trip time and also the throughput variations. Next page, please. And the, and the third and the fourth step in the first step we deploy the <coughs> DUT or SDUT for example uh, one device running the uh, TCP or quick or congestion protocols and next page please and also we uh, <coughs> introduce some uh, benchmarking tests in uh, our draft here we believe that a range of performance indicators should be considered the first one is the throughput and we can use some common tools such as iperf and quickperf to uh, test the throughput results and next and also we think the round trip time and transfer efficiency is very important performance indicators for the protocol testing in for the istn here is a, is a details more details you can uh, we encourage you to read our draft and to save time here we can just uh, make a pass okay next page please and also we think the buffer delay percentage which represents the increase in the RTT during TCP throughput test virus the inherent or baseline RTT is an important metric to quantify the performance. Next page, please. Oh, hey, Zach, could, uh, okay. could I, I'm so sorry. I think we're out of time. Is it possible to go to the very last slide? I'm... Okay. The last slide, next slide, please, slide. Okay. Uh, oh. <laughs> maybe the, the results one, the re results. Okay, 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 maybe conclude and uh, yeah, yes. So this is our some of our previous re, premium re results. We correct the real trace from the uh, real satellite network. So this the left figure shows the loss variations, and the, the right part is our uh, delay and throughput results. Also, let's conclude our work. <coughs> is the final the final one? Can I find a page, yeah. please? Uh, maybe the previous one. Yes. So finally, let, let me please let me conclude our work. So next, we will uh, continue to improve our benchmarking methodology, and also we are looking forward to uh, more collaborations with our industrial partners, such as the Satellite China Telecom, which now provides the direct sale to satellite performance service for the terrestrial users. And also, we are uh, looking forward to collaborate with the China Satellite Network and to benchmark the, our DOT and SUT in their non-operating network environments. So that's all, thank you very much. And I'm so sorry, I maybe no I problem. used too much. It's our thank fault. You. Yeah, it, it's my fault for suggesting people could talk longer, sorry. <laughs> I like that Sarah at the, the desk has a new hat. That's a pretty good look for Sarah there. Thank you, thank you. Okay. It's also my first so, time, the next time will be more strict on <laughs> So any so, questions and comments are more than welcome. Yeah. So Zeki, thank you for uh, showing up. And several of you have, this is your first IETF and presenting in person. So thank you. I think we'll ask to take questions on this draft to the list. Uh, I encourage folks to read it. It's a pretty well-written presentation, but I, I do think it needs a bit of review and feedback from the rest of the, the group. And in general, I say it's a pretty rich position to be in when we have test results we didn't even get to today because we ran out of time. Uh, it was a really good discussion. I think there are a lot of um, follow-ups that we need to, to cover on the list. I, I think, Giuseppe, if I'm not wrong, I think we're out of time now, are we not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I ju just want to say I'm presenting only the first page of this slide that we missed from my check, and I will encourage people to download the slides and have a look. Maybe the next week. Okay. Yeah, just yes. yeah, very, 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 very I was I was going to ask Magic actually rather than rush through this because it deserves more than thirty seconds when we're already four minutes out yeah, of time. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going I'm not going to present Sarah. Uh, ah. I just wanted to uh, defer it. So um, okay. I and I actually have a question to the work group and the question to the chairs. Um, we can do it two ways. 
One is, uh, as at the opening, I propose to have a bar both at, uh, at tonight after the happy hour uh, hackathon. Um, Radko will be attending remotely. I'm here in person. Unfortunately, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. So if anybody is interested in those results, um, please join us. I will announce it on the BMWG list. And I will also, I've been asked to send it to the all IT attendees uh, for ITF 118 in case there is interest outside of BMWG. So I would like to go ahead with that if the work group is happy and if there is, a, if there is an interest, that's one. For those who are remote, um, I guess we could have a, an interim BMWG meeting, uh, fully remote, where we're happy to, to present those results. Uh, so again, that's again for, for chairs and the team to decide here. Uh, on behalf of Ratko, I wanted to apologize for missing the graphs that we didn't have in the slides due to technical problems. The graphs are now available. I will send the updated version to the slides to the chairs so they will be posted. And again, we can discuss them at the bar buff today. I don't know how the bar buffs are working with the remote access. We don't have a side room booked because they all booked out. But uh, I will chat with the, with the chairs here and see if there is anything else. But uh, please watch the BMWG list. We expect more, more activity on this uh, tonight. Thank you. So uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the chairs in the room can make the decision with you guys on how the bar boss is going to work. Where the rest of us who are remote, that's a little tough. Got it. For the second thing about an interim meeting or not, I'd like to defer making that decision um, to first having the conversation on the list around the SR drafts and the merging and not and addressing magic and uh, Karsten's comments. Because if we can't, uh, quickly come to a consensus in email, uh, then I would propose that we do our first interim meeting or the first interim meeting I think I've ever been on for BMWG. We, we don't usually do those. I'm a little concerned about attendance, but we could propose to put those two things on the list, the SR drafts uh, in your item there, Magic, and then if it doesn't shake out, we'll defer these to 119. Would that work for folks? Okay. It's okay. All right, good to see that Warren is donating his I'll also my battery pack. confirm that is okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for hanging out for the extra six minutes. We appreciate it and for the good conversation today. Have a good afternoon, folks. Good morning. Oops, sorry. <laughs> good night. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Thank you very much.